11 tonight, uh, as we finish up this series right from the start, as we talked about going through this, we uh, wanted to <coughs> go back and, and go back over some things that we kind of know, but uh, maybe there were some details that we needed to fill in, especially about uh, creation evidence and things like that, and the evidence that supports a biblical view young earth creation, and Noah's flood. And as uh, we uh, have seen and we've looked at in this and examined, there is uh, an abundance of evidence that supports the biblical view and the uh, historicity of the Bible and the uh, truth of Noah's flood and so forth. Uh, we've gone through that. We looked at the after the flood as the... Uh, Nations began to spread out and where some of those people groups wound up, uh, some of the things they did. And tonight we'll uh, continue that line of thought. But if you remember one of the principles we've talked about, and we always need to watch for in any of our Bible study, especially when we're reading through any historical narrative in the Bible, and some of the prophetic books have this principle too, is a return for detail. And a lot of this, if you remember, is written in kind of like headline form. Basically, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it will return and give some detail of like a timeline, a narrative. And then it'll, the next chapter may give details of exactly how He did some part of a particular creation or something like that. It may give a, a narrative, kind of an overview, and then it, it may return for some detail. We find this a lot in Revelation too. One reason why it makes Revelation so hard to understand because we want to read it in a straight chronological order and it can get confusing. Genesis is kind of that way too because we'll see you know, the creation of Adam and the creation of Adam and Eve and it'll give some details and if you try to just read it in straight chronological order it, it will seem kind of confusing. So what we find tonight in chapter 11 is kind of a return for detail to give us more information about some of the things that happened in chapter 10 and the reason why chapter 10 even happened. So, that being said, let's go ahead and get into our uh, verses and we'll uh, look at some scriptures here. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Uh, Shinar basically is what we would call Mesopotamia, the upper regions of the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. That's uh, called in ancient times the land of Shinar. So that was the first place they went and they into that fertile river valley and they began to settle there. <clears throat> Verse 3, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. Slime here, pretty much generally believed to be uh, like an asphalt type of substance, tar, like an asphalt tar. The reason they believe that is because in archaeological digs, they found these ancient stone wall or brick, mud brick walls mortared together with asphalt tar. So that's the uh, reason why generally slime. If you remember uh, over in Genesis 19, or, or Genesis, I think, 17 or 18, where Abraham fights the five kings, Chedorlaomer and some of these other kings, and it says that they ran into the, the valley of Sodom and it was full of slime pits. Well, there's, there was asphalt pits there, much like, you know, little bread tar pits in California. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, they had brick for stone, slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, 
lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So here we find that the people, they all spoke the same language. This time they were all still closely related to one another, although they were beginning to, you know, group in families and so forth. They were still united. So let's, you know, and, and by this time you had Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter and was beginning to gather a following of people unto him, uh, starting to build cities. And so they said, it's the first thing let's do. Let's be unified and let's build a city. And let's build us a great tower and so forth. Now, there's debate over whether they wanted to build the tower uh, because they didn't believe God wasn't going to flood the earth again or if they were wanting to build a high place for worship. Um, I think the dominant evidence is toward that they wanted to build a high place for worship because subsequent towers, pyramids, ziggurats that were built for the majority contain platforms on top for worship of the heavenly bodies, the stars, sun, moon, and stars, and those kind of things. But anyway, they want us to let us all, you know, be one, build a city and a tower and so forth, <coughs> and everything, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole of the whole earth. Kind of the beginnings of a one world system. And remember, as we read through these things, Satan has already set the course for this world. Satan is at work and he is already manipulating things around to raise up groups of people to do his will or assist him in his will of usurping dominance of the world. Remember, he wants to take possession of the earth and the heavens. So there's an evil you know, element behind this Satan is behind this too, using the human agent and so forth. And so uh, what he began to do then, he has done really ever since. And he's doing it today. Alright, so now, here's an artist's rendering of the Tower of Babel. It's like a famous painting. I don't remember who painted it. But anyway, artist's rendering of the Tower of Babel. Now, tell me, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, apparently the artist, I don't know how well you can really see much of the details there in that picture, but apparently the artist didn't read the Bible before they started painting a picture of the Tower of Babel from the Bible. What are these guys standing on right here? A huge big block of stone. What are they working on down here? And what do they have on this cart down here rolling up to build the tower? Huge big blocks of stone. Did they build the Tower of Babel out of huge big blocks of stone? No. It says <laughs> brick for stone and slime for mortar. So it was a mud brick structure. So the reason I the, the reason I use this painting, this is by some famous artist. I don't remember, I should have looked it up. But anyway, you know, this is this is how this is how biblical folklore creeps in. Because we, we have these things that everybody sees and this forms the image of what happened in this Bible story instead of the details out of the Word of God. So I just wanted to use that kind of Tower of Babel and that illustrates this. This is how misinformation comes in. And folklore gets started of biblical things that aren't true. You know? So anyway, they started to build the Tower of Babel. Here's a picture of an ancient mud brick wall in, uh, in ancient Babylon. This is, or parts of that are best they can tell as old as all the way back to Babel, the first you know, cities, construction there. Uh, ancient Babylon, they know where it is. It's you know, over there in that desert. These places have been uh, preserved and they've pre been preserved with many, many inscriptions and engravings and clay tablets and all that kind of stuff that says this is Babylon. You know? So when they began to excavate over there in the mm, late 1800s or so, uh, they, they began to find these amazing finds. And so they know exactly where Babylon and Nineveh and all those cities were, no doubt about it. 
Um, now, had they already forgotten their instructions from God? Or they, were they just directly rebelling against them? Because it was just hadn't been that long before that that we find this happen as soon as they came off the ark. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, there's another interesting thing here, and I'm going to go way off into it, but it is interesting that when they came off the ark, it said, God bless Noah and his sons. Well, we know what happened with one of those sons, Ham, because, I mean, with the whole deal with Noah, and, you know, drunk in the tent, and they saw him naked, and his Canaan was cursed, and all this kind of what, you know, applied to Ham too, apparently. So, you know, in spite of the fact that God had blessed all three of the sons, you know, one of them still went bad. Anyway, so, and God told them, so here's, your, here's your order. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, you can't replenish the earth if you all stay bunched up in one place. They knew because they knew what the original orders from God was to Adam and Eve and their descendants. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Spread out all over it and subdue the earth. Take dominion of it. You know, it's Adam and Eve and their descendants who would also be educated in the things God was beginning to educate Adam and Eve in of how to take dominion of the earth and so forth. Remember that, uh, uh, and I may kind of hit some of the highlights as we go through this tonight. I probably shouldn't because we may run out of time. But, but we want to remember that uh, the Garden of Eden was Adam and Eve's school. God put them there to educate them. He walked, with, you know, walked in the garden every day and talked with them. Well, he was educating them so that they would know how to do what he had for them to do, which is take dominion of the earth. So they were gonna they would then educate their children and go on and so forth and do that. To fill the earth, that was God's plan for them. So when it came to the Tower of Babel, and they said, Look, we all speak the same language, we're all basically related to each other, back to Noah. Um, Let's build a city here and let's build a tower. We're in this fertile river valleys. We can grow plenty of food. We don't need to go anywhere else. We're safe here. We can be secure. Uh, let's just stay here and be all one people and so forth. Lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. So that was in really direct disobedience of God's directive to them. So I don't think they were just doing that by mistake. I think it was direct rebellion against it. Nimrod was the leader. We talked about Nimrod uh, I think last week and uh, some of the things he did. Anyway, he was a mighty hunter. He was one of the first monarchs, I guess we could say, that set up a monarchical system and began to lead people away from the patriarchal system that they had been under before. So, Back to Genesis 11. It says, And the Lord came down. Remember, this is Lord in all capital letters. means the Lord God Most High. This is the, mo the highest title or you know, name of God, title of God that is used in the Bible. The Lord God Most High came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That's kind of a very intriguing statement there. Because, okay, number one, that you know clues us into the fact that God kind of knew what was on their minds and what they were imagining to do. This also tells us that just building a city and building a high tower and all, you know, staying there all together and not spreading out over the earth, that wouldn't be the end of it. That was only the beginning of what they were going to do. Uh, so apparently, maybe we're not, you know, given details of what else was on their minds or maybe they, you know, were busy building the tower. That was step one. Once that was done, then that would be used as a, like a... Uh, base of operations to then, you know, spread out over the world but dominate any other people as they as they went. Don't really know. 
but it probably would have involved turning into a center of power and worship of Satan. Because we know Satan was behind this because his man, Nimrod, who was a type of the Antichrist all the way back there. Remember, Satan hasn't changed his tactics. He's done the same thing all the way through history. He's tried to do the same thing. Raise up a man, lead a group of people, spread out, take over the earth. He hasn't been able to do that yet. One day he will. When, you know, whichever man is uh, under his command that uh, uh, is allowed to go forth with that plan and will be the Antichrist, will, that will happen. But so far it hasn't. So there were some things that they were uh, would have imagined to do. So God took a look at that, knew what they were going to do, and, and so forth, and said, uh, uh, we've, got to, we've got to do something to stop this. It's also interesting that God wasn't maintaining, if you notice, a heavy-handed control over people in that day. He was pretty much just letting them spread out, uh, pursue their creativity, their industry, uh, you know, and so forth, which really was what they were supposed to do. He had created the earth for people. They were to take the resources and things and uh, use them to their, uh, you know, however they needed. So uh, he didn't have a heavy-handed uh, control over people at this time. Now, let's see what happened. Wait a minute. Let's talk about imaginations. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 8. <clears throat> this is uh, when they came off the ark. Noah built an altar and sacrificed some of the clean animals. And here we find the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. So, when, as we see back here in Genesis 11, God come, comes down, look at the city, see what they're doing, and He makes this statement, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. We know that what God thinks of man's imaginations is that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So God knows that if he doesn't do something to stop that, whatever they come up with is going to be evil. It will be evil imaginations. So for that reason, uh, he knows something's got to be done. So from God's standpoint, it wasn't just that they were being rebellious. I mean, really, eventually, they would have spread out. They eventually would have. You know, there would have, the population would have grown too much, they would have had to spread out eventually. But, with what they were, the direction they were going, God knew that it was going to wind up similar to the way it was before the flood, so we knew He had to do something to divide these people. So here we notice again, God doing what again? Making another division in something. So, anyway, uh, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his, from his uh, youth. Let's look at what Paul said here in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. He said in, in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at this uh, be a, you know, a week or two before we get to this part. But we'll spend some time here when we get into this study. And this is uh, Romans, 8, uh, Romans 1, and 18 through 32 is a pretty good indictment of man and so forth. Part of, in part of it we see this. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are what without excuse. Because, and this is kind of specifically aimed toward those people that live between creation and the flood. They saw those things. They saw the world in its perfect created state. Even being cursed, still it had much of its uh, characteristics of the original creation. Uh, the things that testified of God, even more than what we see in our world. <clears throat> because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became 
vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This ties back to what we're looking at there in Genesis 11, where Paul's talking about vain in their imaginations. So this applies to before the flood, but this also applies to what was happening at the Tower of Babel. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul uh, writes instructions to the Corinthians. And remember, this is in doctrinal instructions to us, too, in the body of Christ. Gives us a lot of insight. And we're not going to go into a lot of details here. just want to use this for an illustration. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down what? Imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So Paul, again, gives us clues to what was happening back there at the Tower of Babel when he says, that casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, that's what was happening there. And that's why their imaginations were just going to you know, take off and it would have ended in even worse paganism and ungodliness than uh, what did happen in Babylon and what developed there. So I wanted to use these things to illustrate why there are specific reasons why that word imaginations is used there in that text in Genesis 11. All right, <clears throat> so let's go to let's look at Romans 12 right quick, where Paul instructs us. Okay, let me bounce that off of this. As far as weapons of our warfare, you know, not carnal and so forth, mighty through God, that we're casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Have you ever tried to do that in the, just the power of your willpower? I'm going to cast down imaginations and I'm going to you know, bring every thought to the captivity. That, you know, you had preachers stand up there and tell you that's what you're supposed to do. They never told you how, uh, and so forth. You try to do that, and oh, man, you know, the more you try not to think bad stuff, the worse you think. Well, there's a, there's a reason why, and there's a way to do that. We have to be educated to be able to do that. It doesn't just happen automatically. Paul says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you, that you may prove or test out what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, anyway, that's kind of a preview of some of, some of the things we're going to look at in the book of Romans as we will go into the education how to do these things, how these things come about, how they become uh, worked out in our lives. So, let's go back to Genesis. Here's what God said to do. He says, go to, let us go down. Us there, in the plural, God, the, the, the Godhead, God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You'll notice kind of a precedent throughout the Bible, a principle, precedent, I guess, there are times when, uh, when God just speaks to someone, gives them instruction or direction, something like that. Uh, like when He talked to Moses, when He talked to Abraham, and we get, we get the sense of God the Father <clears throat> speaking like that. Uh, when we find God come down to the earth to physically... Um, do some kind of act or make a change of some kind or physically affect something, most of the time we find all three. We find God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all show up there on the earth if they're, if they're going to make some physical effect, alteration, correction, something like that on the earth. Uh, we, you know, we see... Uh, all three of two specific times during Jesus' life and ministry that you had all three show up in a physical form on the earth at Jesus' uh, baptism when uh, God the Father spoke the voice from heaven. Uh, of course, the Son was physically there in the person of Christ and then the uh, Holy Spirit manifested in the form of a dove. Also, the Mount of Transfiguration 
We had, uh, of course, Jesus was there, the Son. We had uh, God the Father who spoke, you know, this is my beloved Son, and so forth. And I also had the Holy Spirit uh, manifest, physically manifest in the cloud, the bright cloud that surrounded him there. So that's, that's, that's why we find this principle in play here. Uh, we find that throughout the Bible. They all three came down, the, the Godhead. He said, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So, now, I believe from uh, looking at archaeological evidence, um, even written histories we have, which really not any, hit, any written histories that, you know, are extant today. They may be, and they may be all suppressed in the basement of some, you know, museum or university somewhere. But uh, archaeological evidence indicates that at one time, about sometime around 5,000 years ago, sophisticated, knowledgeable, megalithic stone structure building cultures, societies, appeared all over the world at about the same time. And also there's evidence that sophisticated, knowledgeable, skilled people groups who basically lived a Stone Age life suddenly appeared all over the world because there, uh, there are places where they lived, caves, camps, so forth, that have their artifacts, uh, nothing below that. They were the first ones there. And it all kind of coincides at about the same time. So there's a lot of archaeological evidence that points to this biblical account where that God scattered the people all over the face of the earth in a relatively short time. Remember, this was probably about maybe 400 years after the flood, so the animals had had time to scatter out all the world and populate and all that. There were, you know, plant growth, uh, fruit trees, and all those kind of things had grown up. So there was a lot of food out there all over the world. So when these people scattered out, they could find abundance of good water, uh, abundance of food, and everything they needed was out there. So it's not hard to believe that uh, these groups scattered all over the world. Now, did every person there at the Tower of Babel suddenly speak a different language? I mean, did every individual have their own individual language? There's no way to know that. I'm going to tell you what I think. I believe that because we can, we can look in the, in the biblical record, in some of these genealogical records, in the record of the nations, and basically, when God split these people up, He split all the people up into about, well, 70 nations of people. And a lot of times when the Bible refers to the nations, all the way through, from the oldest accounts all the way into Revelation, when it's talking about the nations, it's talking about those 70 people groups. So, I think that it's, it's likely, no way to know because we're not given these details, that there were groups of people that either were from the same family or whatsoever, or whatever they, uh, maybe they, there were beginning to develop certain racial differences, racial traits among the people. And it could be that there were already you know, groups of people that were kind of, kind of similar to each other. And so God gave that group of people a language. And they were similar. They eventually found the people that they could understand and communicate with. So whoever they could communicate with, they formed in groups. And what happens automatically and rapidly when you take a group of people that's united and then you immediately cause some kind of distinct divisions among groups of those people. They separate quickly. 
you know, I mean, they uh, they group together with people that are like them, <coughs> speak the same language, and off they go. So, uh, whether that was the case or not, they <coughs> spread all over the world. There's another interesting thing, too, and we find this in a lot of ancient cultures, and I believe this to be true because there's evidence of it. We, we've seen it. We've personally seen this and taken photographs of it. There was a common pictographic language in use in ancient times that apparently people used all over the world because you find the same pictographic symbols carved on cave walls and canyon walls. We, we've seen in Israel uh, on the wall of a canyon these ancient pictographs of, you know, people figures, things like that, animal figures. Uh, and you can also see the exact same symbols in the American Southwest. And I'm not talking about just similar. They're exactly the same. And it's not just there. There are other places over the, over the world where uh, you can find these similar and uh, same pictographic symbols. So there are evidences out there that show us that people spread rapidly all over the world and they took with them some common knowledge, and it, you know, varied as they went, and so forth. Um, so they could have come over here before Columbus did. Oh yeah, there's no doubt about it. In fact, there, uh, there's abundant accounts <coughs> of back like in, well, from the late 1700s all the way through the 1800s, as the settlers spread west, one of the things they encountered from the East Coast all the way, well, even past the Mississippi, but mainly in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley, thousands and thousands of uh, mounds, what we would think of Indian mounds. Uh, you know, you may have heard of the Great Serpent Mound, one long mound over there that's in the shape of a serpent, very long, and, and the Cahokia culture and so forth. There are dirt pyramids uh, that are as large as the uh, Egyptian pyramids. On the, the, the base diameter is as large as the Egyptian pyramids and similar in size to many of the pyramids down in uh, Central and South America. Uh, in Cahokia, it's Illinois, and I think is Illinois. Anyway, over the, over the years and all the way back to like in the late 1700s, they began to excavate these mounds. And when they began to excavate these mounds, well, they, you know, they found pottery and they found flint tools. Well, they began to find human skeletons. But it wasn't what they expected to find because, you know, the indigenous groups that were there were what we think of as Indians, you know, about normal sized people, dark hair, and no, you know, no facial hair, and those kind of things. Well, these skeletons that they began to find were eight feet tall, and they had long red hair and red beards, and they had copper armor and, and all kind of things that, that didn't fit in. So, of course, this was way back there. They didn't have uh, the means or, you know, chemicals like PVA and stuff like that to preserve these bones, and, uh, you know, a lot of the bones crumbled when they were exposed to air. Uh, as time went on and the scientists began to excavate these mounds and investigate these finds, uh, they would unearth hundreds of these skeletons anywhere from 6 foot 9, 6 foot 11, all the way up to 9 feet tall. Uh, these preserved skeletons. And they had, you know, red hair, sometimes black hair, uh, sometimes blonde hair they would find with these skeletons. And they began to find other artifacts that didn't fit in with the uh, established historical uh, viewpoint that the only people that were here before you know the settlers came were the Indians. They found abundant evidence that there was this mound builder culture, and the mounds are most of them are still, or a lot of them are still there. Many of them have been destroyed, unfortunately. But a lot of them are still there with thousands of skeletons that show that before any of the Indians ever came to North America, there was this sophisticated mound builder race <coughs> who lived here. And they were a race of giants. 
And even the, uh, the Smithsonian investigated. They sent out scientists for years and years. They excavated these mounds. They collected all the bones. And they collected all the artifacts. They went back to the Smithsonian Institution. And nobody ever heard a word about it since then. You can't find the reports. You can't find the bones. Nobody knows anything about it. And the reason that's done is because if you start finding evidence that verifies that there were giants in the earth, what does that mean? <laughs> it means this is true. This is true in a major historical fact. And they are not going to allow any kind of evidence that points to any kind of historical accuracy in the Bible. I don't care what they have to sweep under the rug. So, anyway, yeah, yeah, there were there were races of people here, you know, thousands of years before the uh, settlers came, or even before. Really, you know, we we and not to not to downplay how the Indian tribes were treated or anything like that, but uh, you know, they kind of were newcomers. They, uh, they hadn't been here for thousands of years, you know. I mean, they came here and they took over from whoever was before them. And then we took over from them. So, you know, that's kind of the pattern of the world. But, uh, yeah, there were in uh, uh, Central and South America uh, cultures such as the Olmecs, which very little really definite records are found of the Olmecs. We have those giant carved stone heads, you know, and uh, all the Olmec carved stone heads, they look like Africans. I mean, every feature about these things look like Africans. But, you know, uh, historians and scientists will deny that there was ever any cross uh, transatlantic contact in ancient times, uh, you know, to South, North and South America. But, uh, the, uh, you know, the archaeology doesn't verify that story. Another thing that's interesting that they found in uh, <coughs> Central and South America, and some even in the, on the west coast of the U.S., is uh, jade objects, and objects that are obviously of Japanese or Chinese origin. And these are found in uh, archaeological sites that are, you know, thousand years old. So. How did that get here? Unless somebody sailed across here and brought it with them. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, the archaeology tells one story and uh, secular history likes to tell another story. And the reason that those kind of things are not talked about and they're, not, and they're kind of swept aside is because anything that verifies the historical record of the Bible or a, anywhere near a biblical timeline Got to get rid of that. So, said so all that to say this: that yes, the archaeology does, in many ways, point to verification of this. What we're looking at right here: that the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and so forth. They left off to build the city. So. No, it was a map. Um, so they were, okay, about right here, somewhere right in there. Here's a, the Tigris Euphrates River Valley, right in there. So Babel would have been about right in there somewhere. So they, we know from looking at last week, the uh, descendants of Japheth spread out here. They were the, the Greeks. And the Europeans of uh, what became the British and so forth, probably some of the Scandinavian peoples, some of the Russian peoples, probably, uh, they began to settle up in here. The descendants of Ham, most of them came down here. They became the, the North African and probably all or most of the African tribes. Uh, some of them probably spread over into India, maybe even down as far as into Australia and so forth. Uh, the east, maybe China, the uh, descendants of Shem, <coughs> Arabia, the Middle East there, Israel, and uh, so forth in that area. But at some point, uh, they, they all wound up, uh, people wound up over here too. 
And uh, that's why we find these ancient megalithic cultures all over really north, and central, and south America. And uh, they brought with them a lot of sophisticated knowledge, too. It's amazing some of the artifacts they found in the mound builder culture right kind of Ohio and Mississippi Valley up in there. Uh, they know that they were active in the copper mining trade that occurred in ancient times in the upper peninsula of Michigan. They believe that over a billion pounds of high-grade copper were mined from there in ancient times. Uh, they think you know, the, the, the copper is kind of a unique place in the world. This copper formed in a, in, in a kind of a state where you can nearly just kind of break the rock out from around it, and you can take this copper and hammer it into form. But they learned how to heat it, smelt it. They learned how to anneal it and harden it, so they were able to make, you know, hard edge tools out of this copper. And a lot of that's found... And a lot of the, you know, uh, a lot of the Midwest and Eastern uh, states up there where the mound builder cultures work. All right. <clears throat> These are the generations of Shem. And I'm going to read through this kind of kind of pretty quick. There's, there's really one or two main points we want to see out of this list of lineage of this one begat that one and lived so many years and so forth. So I'm going to read through this and then I'll stop and point out these two things but they're, because they're kind of interesting. And it's something else that we want to, kind of one of those fact, factoids we want to have in the memory bank or maybe right in the margin of your Bible. Uh, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begat our fact said two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. Arphaxad lived 5 and 30 years and begat Salah. Arphaxad lived after he begat Salah 403 years and begat sons and daughters. So kind of notice the ages of these guys. Shem lived about 600 years. His son Arphaxad lived uh, 403 years and so forth. <clears throat> Salah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Saul lived after he begat Eber 403 years. Well, that would make him, what, 460-something. begat sons and daughters. And Eber lived 4 and 30 years and begat Peleg. Now, you remember the deal about Peleg? That Peleg, during his lifetime, the earth was divided. And what we talked, those divisions were what we saw in chapter 10, where they were divided in, by their tongues, their languages, in their families, by their nations, you know. That was the division that occurred during Peleg's life. So apparently, Peleg was alive during the Tower of Babel incident. When God came down, saw the tower, their imaginations confounded their languages and scattered them out all over the world. Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Reu. Peleg lived after he begat Reu 209 years and begat sons and daughters. Reu lived uh, 2 and 30 years and begat Sarah. Sarah lived after he begat Reu lived after he begat Sarah 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Sarah lived 30 years and begat Nahor. And Sarah lived after he begat Nahor. 200 years, he begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived 9 and 20 years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah 119 years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, here's the thing that I want you to see. It's an interesting thing. All right. Before the flood, those guys lived... 930 years, 969 years, 900 and something years, 800 and something years. The average lifespan of the, say, pre-flood generation, including Noah and Shem, because they were, you know, born before the flood. The other two sons were, but you notice nowhere are we given the life 
time, uh, the, the number of years of Japheth or Ham. We don't know how long they lived. Okay, average lifespan pre-flood generation was, not, I think, 917 years. And now you notice back here is our facts ad and some of these other guys, they lived, you know, 500 years, 430 years, 460 years, and so forth. Down here until we get to Peleg. And Peleg lived 209 years. And then he got sons and daughters and so forth. The guy after him lived 200 and something years and got sons and daughters. At the flood, God cut the life expectancy in half. He cut the lifespan in half at the flood. Average lifespan after the flood was like 403 years, I think, something like that. It wouldn't be hard to average it out, but it's 400, I think 403 years, something like that. And those from the flood, that generation that lived up until Peleg, when the earth was divided by the God separating everybody at the Tower of Babel, after that, they lived 200 years, 209 years, and so forth. So at the Tower of Babel, God cut the lifespan in half again. Life expect, uh, lifespan after the Tower of Babel was about 209 years. So right about in half. And it's interesting that we, we see every time God takes a divine action, He cuts the lifespan in two. Probably, knowing what happened at, before the flood, when people lived 900 and something years, all of the stuff they could come up with, and so as part of his restraint on mankind being able to pursue all of the evil imaginations that he could come up with, he cut their lifespan in half to where, you know, 900 and something years, 400 and something years, now 200 and something years. And then we, by the time of Abraham's life, that would dwindle down. Abraham lived 175 years. Uh, Isaac lived to be, I think, 137 years. Jacob lived 147 years, I think. And then Joseph lived 110 years. Joshua lived 110 years. And so, down to about a hundred years or so. So we see, a, you know, a few generations down, by the time uh, the Israelites came out of Egypt, wandered around the wilderness, and entered into Canaan, into the Promised Land, the life span was a, about what it is now. You know, expected a life expectancy or so. So anyway, just kind of an interesting fact that we see there uh, that happen as well as the other things. So we find Abram is born and his two brothers, Nahor and Haran. These are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. Ur is there. You could, well, you wouldn't want to go there today. You'd probably get shot at or something by Islamic terrorists, but you could go to Ur of the Chaldees. They know exactly where it is. You go to the ruins today. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Sarah, Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran. Uh, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. Now, uh, just kind of again, interesting fact here. Another thing to consider, it mentions Lot. It was the son of Haran. Nephew of Abraham. We know the deal with Lot. Uh, how that when they went into Canaan, they kind of spread out throughout the land. They had a lot of people. They had a lot of animals and so forth. Uh, their herd men began to fight because there wasn't enough room. So Abram gave Lot the choice, you know, whatever you want, you just give, you go one direction, I'll go the other direction and so forth. Lot you know, looked down the Jordan Valley it was uh, fertile and well watered, so he went down there, wound up in Sodom, and you remember the rest of the story. Notice that, and we always, well, did you ever wonder, you know, because, because I think it's, who is it, James or Peter, one of them over there, that talks about Lot, that he was a righteous man, and his righteous soul was vexed day to day with a filthy conversation of Sodom, and well, think, why didn't you just get out? Why didn't you move? Did you ever notice? <coughs> then in all these names and names of people, genealogy, 
Lot's wife is never mentioned until he's living in Sodom. I think it's because he married into the family there. He, he didn't have a wife when he went to Sodom. And he married a woman from there. And so that's why he stayed there. One of the reasons why he stayed there uh, and why he was so reluctant to leave. That's why his wife turned and, you know, looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. And why his daughters were so corrupt. You know, you probably remember that story too. Uh, because he married a woman from there. Another interesting thing here is we find, uh, of course, Lot being a son of Haran. And then also we have uh, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, and her sister Iscah. Now, it's, it's interesting that out of all these names and all these lineages, very few women's names are mentioned. And usually if women's names were mentioned, it's because they uh, were prominent in the family and the, it's likely that they inherited property from their father. Uh, whenever, you know, Haran died and so forth, the daughters, Milcah and Iska, probably inherited some property, property rights or something from their father. It's likely that they did. It's one reason why their names are mentioned here. Also, uh, Milcah <coughs> factors into the genealogy of Rebecca and Rachel. So if I've got this right, I should have looked it up. I mean, uh, you know, help me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this. Somebody look it up and tell me next week. I think Milcah was the Mother of Laban, I think. Uncle Laban. Jacob's Uncle Laban. No, and all that. Uh, but anyway, there's a, there's some family connection, the reason why these names are here. So, Abram and Nahor, they're, they're married and they're, you know, uh, let, they've left Ur of the Chaldees and we know what will happen in chapter 12. That's where God comes to Abraham and He makes a covenant with him. And he says, I will uh, make of you a great nation. Uh, your descendants will be as many as the uh, sand of the sea and as the stars of heaven for number and so forth. And the whole very interesting uh, comments we can make study on that. We, we won't go into that tonight. Uh, Why does that not tell who Sarah's daughter was? Let's see. It may be because all right, Sarah. Sarah was Nahor's daughter because she's identified later on in one of those uh, times when Abraham said, "Hey, look, you're very beautiful. We go down here in this country we're really not supposed to be in. They're going to kill me to get you. So tell them you're my sister." And uh, and when he's then trying to explain his way out of one of those times, he says, "She's the." Daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, or, or something like that. And same father, different mother, or same mother, different father. I don't remember exactly, but so I think Sarai was Nahor's daughter. I believe if I've got that lineage right. So anyway, uh, anybody find that yet? I see you're digging over there. But anyway, we can talk about it next week or sometime. So Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his son's son and Sarai his daughter-in-law and his son Abram's wife and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Pretty sure they you know, know where the town of Haran was. Pretty good idea where it was. So that'll end us on our uh, Genesis 1 through 11. You know, we covered a lot of things. Some things in pretty good detail. Some things in you know in not so much detail. But uh, it's important that uh, I felt like it was important that we go through these things, kind of uh, look at some stuff maybe we weren't too familiar with. Uh, before we move on because it's it's very important that we know where everything started because 
You know, we're not going to understand the end if we don't understand the beginning. <laughs> so, anyway, all right, anybody got any questions or discussion on any of this? You know, it can get so confusing when you read all these names and they're hard to pronounce in the first place. This one begat that one, mm -hmm. and on and on and on, and, and you kind of get yeah. lost in it, yeah. and you just shut your Bible and go, I can't <laughs> grasp it. So, so this yeah. is great that we're kind of you know digging deep into it. I, I tell you what, these genealogies are really interesting if you if you take the time to to trace these people out and the connections and the places they ended up in and, and what they did and how they were all connected back to one another. It you know, I know to us it seems like just filler. We go to the page, especially you get over in the Chronicles and some of these places where this is. Well, when you think that, about these were people, they all have life, they all have story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and think about these are people, I mean, they're they're timeless. They're eternal. They're mentioned in God's Word. And we know nothing of like Reu or, or one of these other guys, you know, that we know nothing. Our facts said, what do we know about him? Nothing. You know, no, no details about their life, how they lived and all those kind of things. So, uh, yeah, they were people. I mean, they lived and they, they had the same basic problems we do, <laughs> you know, and, and all that. But it is important. It's important to at least have kind of a an idea of why these genealogies are in here and, and how and why they're important. So, all right. You said something about Milka? Yeah. Rebecca? Yeah. Uh, that's what I was thinking. She was Rebecca's. I'm the daughter of Bethuel. My grandparents are Nahor and Milka. Okay, all right. She was the granddaughter. Rebecca was the granddaughter of Milka. I was thinking there was a family connection there. Somewhere that she was mother or grandmother of Rebecca and so forth down the line. So, uh, all right. So now I'm thinking Rebecca and Laban were brother and sister, I believe. So Rebecca actually would have been Rachel's aunt. I'm thinking. So anyway, you can look that up, or you don't have to. But uh, <laughs> anyway, all right. Anybody else got anything? This is kind of off the subject, but y'all were talking about Super Bowl commercials, Fargo. <laughs> and did anybody see the one about, did, if you saw this commercial, then you were told that we all came from the ocean. Oh. I saw that. Did y'all see that? <laughs> I saw that. It was yeah. the voice of JFK. Uh, or it sounded like yeah. it, you know. And he's talking about, we came from the ocean because we have salt in our tears and there's salt in our blood. And, hmm. You know, salt in your skin when you sweat. You know, there's yeah. salt, and he said there's salt in the ocean. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't. I don't know what the point was, but it, it was. You know, it made the. the yeah. Was it part of the But 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 the point was that yeah. you know we will soon go back to whence we first came. You know, and it was the ocean. Yeah. Point. Oh, well, but the fine. same chemical makeup. You know as the percentage of salt in the water mm -hmm. was the same percentage of salt in our bodies. Yeah. 70 yeah. 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 And the, uh, the, the 17 basic components that make up clay, the same basic components we're made up of. So, you know, the way I look at that is that, uh, you know, they will say, well, we evolved from the ocean, so we got salt. The way I look at it is salt is an incredibly complex and important component mm -hmm. that our our body uses and manages to precisely balance to, to benefit. I mean think about it. We get too much salt, it'll kill us. We don't have enough salt, it'll kill us. You know? So uh, uh, to me it's evidence of the amazing wisdom and creative ability of a divine creator. <laughs> But for you know the majority of the world that doesn't know any better, they're going, oh Except wow, devolution. we came from the ocean. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, let's pray and we'll uh, 